thank you folks for uh, having me. And I'm looking forward to talking about something that I think is very closely aligned with the theme of this meeting because it is very directly targeting the subject of integration, talking about some challenges that we've faced over the past several years and how we've been attacking them through an approach that we've come to call agile data curation. So myself, I am coming out of the synthetic biology world primarily, and we often think about our experimental cycles there um, in what people call the design, build, test, learn loop. Now, of course, you know the realities of the laboratory uh, don't break down quite this neatly, but it's a useful way to uh, start thinking about all the different types of things that you need to do as part of an experimental campaign um, and where the gaps are in it. Um, a couple of years ago, myself and another of my colleagues at uh, Raytheon BBN, Miles Rogers, uh, analyzed where things stand in terms of automation and autonomy for doing these design, build, test, learn cycles. And when you look at each of the elements individually, it looks like we're doing pretty well. You know, there's you know things like the the cello system out there for doing uh, d automated design of genetic regulatory networks, and there's all sorts of great laboratory uh, automation that can help you with build and test, and various different pipelines that can help you with the more routine parts of your analysis. And of course, you know, a human's going to need to interpret at the end and so on. But you may notice that there are some gaps in this diagram. These arrows aren't quite directly connecting. And that's where we find that there's a huge amount of hidden cost in the work that we try to do when we actually want to integrate together all of these different pieces um, in the laboratory and in our information systems in order to really turn the crank on experimental campaigns and engineering cycles. Um, these pieces don't connect very well yet. Um, and there's a lot of information that's missing that requires a lot of um, expertise and effort and cost in order to be able to enable any of these more automated systems to run. So this big gap here is what I really want to focus on today and methods that we're trying to take and encourage other people to take to reduce that hidden cost of curation and configuration of the systems that you want to use for integrated pursuit of experimental campaigns. The first thing that we need is some way to actually talk about all of the different parts of this design, build, test, learn cycle, all the different pieces of the laboratory. And in my own work, what we've ended up centering on is using the SBAL3 representation. SBAL stands for Synthetic Biology Open Language. Uh, this is a standard that's been uh, you know, under development and used by a number of groups for quite some time. And the most recent version of it uh, is uh, very good for linking up together more detailed representations you might have of particular elements within that larger design, build, test, learn cycle. So this is going to be sort of hovering underneath everything that I'm talking about today as the standards glue for uh, putting together all the pieces. And uh, in fact, the reason that I'm not unfortunately able to be there in person is because I'm departing this afternoon for a standards meeting that is working on this and related standards. So let's talk about how we actually start dealing with the curation challenge, where this challenge comes from in the pragmatics of the lab. So when I think about the curation challenge, I think about the experiences that we typically have um, in a laboratory environment with all the pieces that are hooked together by the human experimenter. The way a typical experimental campaign starts is that uh, you, you've got uh, you know, again, in synthetic biology, we're typically thinking about some sort of genetic designs, you know, interventions that we're doing on the organisms. So we've got a bunch of these sitting around. Uh, maybe they're in Benchling or in Ape or Snap Gene or Excel or Word. Sometimes I've had uh, you know partners who designed their genetic sequences in Word, 
And then we've got an ex a plan of what's the experiment going to be that usually started on a whiteboard. Maybe it's an electronic lab notebook. Um, and then a human takes these things and they go off into the lab and they actually run the protocol. And that produces a bunch of data and metadata, uh, which then we go off and analyze. But there's this big hole when we're analyzing these, these things and actually looking at what came out, uh, we've lost the connection to the experiment descriptions and to the genetic designs. And when we're operating at a small enough scale where everything can basically fit in the head of one investigator, that's not a problem. But when we start thinking about larger scales or when we start thinking about getting our AI and machine learning tools involved, this gap becomes a huge problem because um, the machine can't make the connections about what the experiment was that was getting planned, that this data comes from. It doesn't know what sample 15 was, and it doesn't know how to interpret your chicken scratch notes um, that you wrote down things in shorthand because you weren't going to write out all those long, long names over and over again. That's not a good use of human time. But if we're trying to make AI ready data sets, then we really want to pay somehow to get these pieces linked together because otherwise we end up burning huge amount of our, our potential power of the data set, just reintegrating the things that we dropped on the floor when we didn't record the relationships between the different parts of our plans, our designs, and our data. So a number of people have been tackling this in a bunch of different ways. Uh, we were involved in a major effort over the past several years funded by DARPA in what they call the SD2 program, um, which stood for something along the lines of systematic discovery and design. And <clears throat> You know, this was sort of a, a super collider of a program that took a whole bunch of laboratory automation groups and a whole bunch of AI machine learning groups and sort of smashed them together in the cloud uh, to see if we could do cool AI ML stuff with laboratory automation. And the first thing that happened uh, was that everybody tripped over this big curation gap. And over the course of the program, we built up a whole bunch of complicated stuff that filled in that gap and allowed things to be able to be run in a very tightly integrated manner, but at the same time, very agilely, so we could uh, shift to new plans and new experiments without the baked in cost that you often get in automation. So this was cool, but this was all like, you know, on this diagram, there's a lot of arrows, a lot of bubbles. Um, we learned a lot of things in the process of doing this. So as we were coming up towards the end of the program, found myself reflecting back on uh, you know, one of the books that's been very influential for me, The Mythical Man Month by Fred Brooks, which talks about the complexity and stickiness of software engineering. And in that book, one of his key messages is sometimes you need to build one to throw away. That the lessons that you learn in building your first prototype Maybe the thing that you actually want to take away and build a new thing from scratch that's much simpler based on what you've learned there. So we threw away everything that we did there. But as we realized in the process of this, that what we were doing was slowly reinventing something that exists in the computer science and software engineering world in the form of agile software. Now, any of you who do you know, more bioinformatics and software type work may already be quite familiar with some of the agile software tools. Uh, there's this very, very mature ecosystem for handling the complexity of integration in software. Uh, the critical pieces there is distributed version control, typically Git, often served on uh, things like Bitbucket, GitHub, GitLab. Um, and then once around that are created a whole bunch of tools for maintaining integration and quality control, automated build systems, continuous integration, which adds automated testing to automated build in order to make sure that you haven't broken anything when you change something. Uh, and then organizational things for 
helping people coordinate around this with issue trackers and boards and uh, reviews on uh, pull requests, all of these different tools for managing complexity um, and maintaining integration across very complicated, delicate systems. And we asked, you know, it looks like we're trying to reinvent this. Can we just use this? In the biological space, it turns out there are a whole bunch of useful knowledge resources, um, you know, all of these ontologies and databases out there, many of which um, are already very good at making things machine readable, um, but which have a challenge of how do you get the information from those databases effectively curated into um, a form where you could work with them. But they're all linearizable into stuff that looks kind of like code and logs if you have an appropriate representation to be that integration hub, which for us, we have found that SBall, and particularly the SBall 3 version, uh, which um, is fully RDF compatible, lets us work with this very well. So we can talk about um, the experiment designs and the uh, you know biological systems designs and the genetic code. Those all look a lot like software code. Uh, there's a different format, but they serve a very similar role and they have very similar challenges and maintenance. Now the records of execution and uh, the data that we actually get out, those play a very similar role as log files. So for approaching these curation problems, rather than try to build a whole stack from scratch, we've been focusing on the much smaller problem of just figuring out what's the minimal adapters that we need to do to allow all this biological code and log information to be operated on by this extremely mature, very well supported set of software focused tools. We've been finding a lot of success with this, finding that by adopting this, this lets us um, get much cheaper at maintaining integration, automating all of the checklists to make sure that nothing has gone wrong and taking a lot of the boring part out so that we can spend more time focusing on the actual science that we wanted to do. So now I want to spend uh, most of the rest of the talk talking about a few examples of where we've done this recently. The first of these is uh, the 2022 distribution for iGEM. So iGEM, uh, for those who don't know, is a uh, synthetic biology um, community and event uh, teams of uh, high school and college and community lab groups all around the world basically spend a summer doing a synthetic biology project uh, and then get together for a big jamboree in the fall uh, to show off what they've done and be judged and see which ones are the best. So it's a huge event. Um, you know, last year there were about 350 teams, for example. Um, and one of the things that's always been an important part of this is that every participating team gets shipped a collection of standardized DNA parts. Um, so there's a big repository of all the parts that anybody's ever designed from iGEM and of that gets curated out. Here are the ones that we think that all of these teams are likely to find useful as starting points that are easy to assemble together uh, with the standardized BioBricks or uh, type 2S assembly methods uh, in order to build their new constructs. So iGEM had been accreting this, their distribution for a long time in a very sort of ad hoc and centralized way. And two years ago, uh, when they shut down their lab for the pandemic, uh, they took advantage of the opportunity to literally incinerate their old distribution and start rebuilding from scratch in a way that would be a lot more community connected. Um, and you know, I'm uh, one of the co-chairs of the engineering committee, a set of volunteers who work with iGEM on this sort of thing. And we put together um, a process based on agile data curation for building the new distribution that tried to get it to the point where we could have a whole bunch of different people 
collectively designing what are all the parts that should get shipped to people. So we set this up um, in GitHub and people submitted um, you know, these uh, uh, formalized Excel spreadsheets that were you know, made to be both human and machine readable that with their plans for you know, what parts should be in a collection and you know, how they should get stitched together and flanked and such in order to build particular things and put them into particular plasmid backbones as their carriers. So basically build plans and then a bunch of you know, GenBank files, or it could also automatically retrieve things from various online resources. So these are the proposals that people were putting in. Um, we then had a set of automation on the back end built using um, the GitHub Actions automation system that both ran validation and also collated and extracted material, which then could be sent to the partners who are actually manufacturing and distributing um, the material. So sending, you know, what is the particular order that we're going to send to Twist, and what's all the wrapper information that Free Genes needed in order to um, put together the packages with the materials that came out of Twist for shipping around. This automated workflow also fed back into um, the organizational workflow that we put up. We, we adapted uh, one of the standard Agile workflows uh, called Gitflow, uh, where we we're collectively designing what this would be with pulling things out on branches and having people make proposals on a branch and then make a pull request where other people in the community could uh, you know, comment on and make suggestions for improvement and help find bugs. And that pull request also was the point where the validation would come through and say, oh, you know, th there's something wrong with this library design. It's not all machine readable. Here's a problem. Here's what you need to fix. And this joint human and machine process let us be able to focus very much on what was the content that we wanted to be going into these libraries rather than spending the human energy on the sequence collation and sequence wrangling aspects of it. So an example of some of the um, automation that was happening is these library design files in Excel uh, would get, um, were very simple for people to specify in Excel sheets. This is the sort of thing that if you've ever had a conversation on a whiteboard that somebody then wrote down a build plan for, would probably fit very cleanly into these Excel sheets. And we were using these because this is what a lot of people involved in this were throwing around anyway, is Excel sheets of various custom ways. Um, the automation pipeline then took that uh, Excel sheet and extracted out of it um, an SBAL3 model of what the build plan was. So this, for example, is showing um, a build plan of a, you know, a spacer, a, common, a, a UTR promoter coding sequence terminator for a standard um, expression widget with um, a combinatorial library where it's taking two different promoters and uh, combining either of those two with one of a whole collection of different fluorescent proteins and then putting this, the resulting construct into um, a particular backbone. So once it represented what is the build plan, then it could expand it out to say, what are all of the actual constructs that we'd wanna make uh, you know, at a sort of stitched together you know, list of here, 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 and then compute the actual sequence that needed to be synthesized for each of those and export it into FASTA to be uploaded to Twist as an order to actually produce the library. So this is done in, in uh, sort of a microservices approach um, so that we could have each little step be a separate thing uh, and be easy to rejuggle and make it easy to uh, debug these plans as well. Using this automation and the other types of um, you know, uh, validation checking and so on that I didn't talk about here, um, we were able to run a fairly intensive des collective design campaign uh, over the course of about a one and a half month period uh, when the primary work was being done, uh, there was a pace that we kept up of uh, you know, nearly 90 pull requests, hundreds of commits um, with uh, 15 contributors um, across a whole bunch of different countries and institutions, most of whom were not programmers, had never used Git before, but 
were able to get enough up on the user interface that they could use this workflow and participate in collective design of half a megabase of DNA across more than a dozen packages and about 350 different constructs, including a whole bunch of machine generated intermediates and composites as part of those, those library builds, all of which then was manufactured, popped into boxes, and shipped to you know, about 400 teams around the world who are finishing up their projects using uh, these things right now. And we'll be meeting in Paris in a couple of weeks to show off their results. Another example uh, from a different project uh, was a modeling campaign around uh, genetic safety switches for CRISPR-based gene therapy. So. Uh, CRISPR-based gene therapy has a lot of promise of being able to edit or knock out um, you know, uh, genetic uh, disease causing uh, locuses. Uh, however, if you leave the CRISPR around too long, uh, you can have bad side effects in terms of off-target editing or immune response. So people have proposed to have these safety switches self-delete, but timing becomes a very critical question there. If it persists too short, you don't get the therapeutic uh, effect. If it persists too long, uh, then you are more likely to get the bad side effects. And the amount of time that you need something to persist for is very dependent on the specific tissue and genetic target that you're dealing with. Uh, so we're interested in getting tunable timing. Uh, so as an NIH project, we're involved in on this uh, that was looking at uh, how to establish this uh, you know, through different types of architectures. And we started working on this modeling and found that uh, it was starting to kind of spin out of control. We were spending um, you know, months trying to figure out if the model that somebody had put together in MATLAB was really currently matching the, um, <clears throat> the particular um, equations that had gotten written down uh, you know, on paper or in LaTeX and how that related to all of the different things that we were discussing at kind of a whiteboard level. Um, so it was being very, very messy. Uh, so we decided to clean this up uh, with an agile data curation approach, in this case, for our models. Um, so the starting point here uh, was actually um, SBall3 um, uh, code using the PySBall library to uh, specify which ways we wanted to combine different um, sort of whiteboard level circuit architectures which then instead of GitHub, we're using GitLab in this case with its own automation system. That then got expanded out uh, via SBall um, to make all of the individual um, circuits that we wanted to investigate. And then rather than ask the question, you know, has the human translation into equations or models been right? We generated the models, uh, we generated ODE, um, equations uh, that were set up within a simulator context that the whole thing end to end was generated. So we could trigger the simulation from uh, the continuous integration pipeline. And every time that we'd make an update on our modeling, uh, we would get automated regeneration of all the results. Similarly, all the mathematical equations were being generated in LaTeX so that we were generating the supplementary information uh, you know, with a uh, you know, one click as well. And again, we then uh, you know, had collective design that focused on the model development and exploration, leaving the translation of those models and the uh, pieces of actually running them through the pipelines for uh, the automation. So we could spend more of our time having the discussion about what should we model rather than did we model it the way we thought we did. Again, this allowed us to take a lot of uh, burden off of the investigators, uh, let us really scale up. Originally, we were looking at only five circuit architectures, and this let us scale up to an exhaustive uh, exploration, which ended up looking at 31 different architectures. Uh, and the one that turned out to be the only fully functional architecture was not in that initial co collection, and which it was turned out to be a real surprise. It was not predicted, uh, though we could understand it in retrospect uh, once the uh, model-based discovery had led us there. 
Um, again, this allowed us to really intensify our experimental campaign, a purely dry lab campaign in this case, um, where over the course of two months, we had 15 different uh, model iteration and review cycles that got us over those two months far, far, far more than we had in the entire six months previous to putting this system in place. Uh, and a lot us to generate, I, I pitied the reviewers who had to deal with the size of our supplementary information with all of the different models in it. My final example, bringing us into a more integrated with the laboratory. Uh, this is an ongoing project uh, that we have in the space of plant synthetic biology. Uh, with folks at the University of Tennessee. Um, and here, what's going up are uh, flow cytometry FCS files um, and an Excel sheet that specifies um, the genetic constructs and the experimental design. What is in each of those FCS files? You know, what construct was transformed into what strain, what inducers were added, et cetera. Back end is again, GitLab, and here it's taking this Excel sheet, it's turning it into an SBAL descriptor of the experiment and the experiment's relationship to the data files, which then um, drives um, automated analysis uh, with an open, a free and open um, FCS analysis library we have and summary uh, of those results. So here's just some examples of what these spreadsheets look like, where we're again sort of starting at the basic parts. This is using the same sort of thing as the iGEM one did, talking about how those are getting combined together um, and where those go into uh, the FCS files. So, and this, you know, like I said, is an ongoing work, but it, it has been helping us already uh, for uh, intensifying experimental campaigns. So I'll leave with just one thought, which was, so I've been talking about this in the context of biology and especially synthetic biology, but was any of this really about biology? We think that beyond sort of core bio, any other field in which we can talk about clear modular boundaries um, in the different parts of the process and in the knowledge base, where we can talk about the, uh, the needs for composition, traceability, et cetera, any, any other field should probably be able to make use of these agile data curation concepts as well. So in summary, when we face integration, curation and configuration is a really key gap. We really need to have proactive upfront approaches to that or else everything uh, falls down through this gap and it becomes very hard to effectively apply AI to our data sets. Agile data curation is one good way to bridge this gap uh, that's very lightweight because it leverages this existing software engineering ecosystem. And we've been able to deploy it effectively in a number of projects and think it should be applicable to other spaces as well. Last, I would just want to say everything that I've talked about today, uh, you can find online um, you know, in various locations. And the uh, sound interference you may hear from me is my four-year-old who has a no school day today. With that, I will stop sharing and uh, move to questions. Questions? Sure, I can, uh, thank you, Jacob. That was a really great talk that sort of uh, stretched me a, a little bit into um, engineering from biology. So in some ways, I, I might say as a biologist, that was about engineering and not biology. And maybe in part because you use iGEM, but I think it's, it's actually a, a great and perfect example to think about biology and deconstruct it into its various parts. So that leads to my question is, how do you think this could be more broadly used in biology and microbiology for machine learning AI type approaches? Absolutely. And yeah, though I'm coming out of an engineering space, um, 
one of the really key things I points I wanted to make down towards the end is that it really wasn't about the engineering. If you're in a more traditional, you know, investigative microbiology space, if you want to make good use of automation and instrumentation, you still are dealing with, on the one hand, you have what's my experiment design? And on the other hand, you have um, how am I going to integrate all of the different data types that I get across the course of not just one experiment, but typically a whole experimental campaign. Um, this is sort of most obvious in an engineering space, but I've never been involved in an investigative campaign either where you did one experiment and it was done. You do your preliminary test, you learn a little, you learn some more, you, you do some more tests, you get some iffy results, you decide to try a different thing. And if you wanna integrate across that campaign, you've got to, got to, got to have consistency across all of the different descriptions of the experiments that you've run in a machine readable manner. Otherwise, integration is going to be entirely ad hoc, human driven, expensive, and often flawed. So that's, I'll, I'll push back. Anybody, anybody who is doing a complex experimental campaign needs to be curating well if they want their materials to be AI ready. Um, I saw a note in the chat. I also saw a hand go up from Ann Summers. Uh, I want to go to Ann first and then Yorgi next. Um. Thanks. I really enjoyed the presentation. Um, thinking about uh, a question coming off of uh, the previous uh, commenter that has to do with the implementation of this in a pedagogical situation. Uh, and I, I have a, a sort of skill set approach to teaching almost everything I teach uh, in, a, in a graduate context. I mean, there's only so much content that you, you can actually convey. And so I'm, I'm kind of wondering, I mean, some of this sounded a little bit like, um, like a relational database uh, sort of approach that's, that's not uncommon in terms of what we're doing with our own research right now. But is this, um, tell me, where this, if you can, to parse out where this goes beyond FileMaker Pro connected to FileMaker Pro connected to FileMaker Pro. <laughs> In a word, version control. Um, so one of the incredible pains that we had in the DARPA SD2 program was that we were essentially working in a database world. Um, and anybody with permissions on the database could make a change on the database that nobody else was informed about or consented about before the database came in. The other thing, this is a more technical point, but I think you should think not relational database, but graph database. The big mm -hmm. difference between relational database and graph database is relational database is very efficient, but inflexible. It's hard to add information that didn't fit very well mm -hmm. into the schema. Graph database is very flexible. And the challenge with graph database is maintaining consistency because people can put stuff that didn't fit in the schema. And then, you know, what do you do with that? Uh, you can ignore it cheaply, but if you want to make use of it. So this is where the database itself, you know, in our world, we're basically working with uh, triple collections in RDF. Uh, it's a very sort of basic graph database world. But the, the database technology is not the interesting thing. The interesting thing is how do people agree that a particular change in the database is a good change to make? And that's where the connection to version control and agile uh, systems is really good. And where being able to have a piece of, of automation that gives you a green check mark that said, what you did is at least still syntactically consistent. You haven't obviously broken anything, helps the humans have the science discussion and not the database discussion. Yeah, no, I'm a big fan of versioning. So uh, yeah, okay, yeah. thanks. I really yeah. appreciate it, yeah. Yeah, and remember, it's not just the version control, it's the ability to have the social workflow integrated with the version control yeah. to have the discussion. Stay in touch, stay in touch. Yeah, thanks. All right, so Georgi asked in the chat, uh, you know, how long does it take to integrate new workflows? And um, 
it really depends a lot on how far off you are from what you've got already and um, how heavy the data is. When we're working with lightweight data, I found it's very cheap. It's generally taken us, you know, one to two months of time to set up a new workflow. I would expect that it would probably get much cheaper over time as we are doing less novel things with each new workflow and more just redeploying I mean, different configurations of uh, you know different sets of microservices. Um, but you know, it's still it's I would consider that to be relatively cheap in my view. Uh, let me toss back to uh, do we have any more of the in person questions? Yeah. Yeah, so Jake, we have a question here. So that was a very interesting talk. I did have a question about your implementation about cross domain um, maintenance of intent. So many projects nowadays, they, they encompass, say, many different types of experiments. So I've got a project that can encompass, say, mass spectrometry or NMR and molecular dynamics analysis. So in your workflow, how do you envision maintaining the the um, intent of the experimenters as a, a th through different databases, let's say. Yeah, so so this is where for us at least, um, using SBAL3 is a really key choice to make because that lets us put pointers to all of those different databases in one place. Uh, so a lot of the more specific data formats you know, come with their own metadata standards. You know, FCS is a great example of that, of one that I've dealt with a lot. You know, if you're working with FCS, you're working with the FCS 3.0 or 3.1 standard, it's got a whole thing about metadata and how you do or don't encode information about your instrument. And you're kind of locked into that and you should be. But the thing that SBAL3 lets me do is to talk about this FCS file can I say how it relates to that plate reader file and how that plate reader file relates to um, this RNA-seq file over here and that mass spec file over here? Which ones were generated from the same sample? Which ones were generated from different samples? Uh, you know, for this RNA-seq file, what's the genome, what's the expected genome that I should be interpreting it against? So that type of information, you can encode all of that um, campaign level metadata in SBAL3. And then how you deal with the integration of the results you produced across that, that's going to be much more specific to your experiment. But this will let you deal with the question of just how are these things aligned in the human's heads in the first place so that you even can build automation to deal with the the content level integrations. Like first we have to get the syntax right. And then we can think about the semantics. Excellent, thank you. Jake, we have one more question here. So first of all, uh, excellent talk to begin with. Second of all, I'm curious as to you could call it the human perspective or the psychology of changing approaches in this manner. It's undeniable that software development has a significantly different culture and research environment than what we could call a lab research as it were. So given that we've already seen large scale implementations of this agile approach over the research landscape, I'm curious how you you've seen the uh, human approach change over that time, if at all. Yeah, so, so in software, there has indeed been a dramatic revolution over the past 20 years in how people think about their relationship to their code and their relationship to their team. 20 years ago, uh, you know, software people were, were sort of, you know, there was sort of this lone genius theory and like, they're not going to write code with bugs in it, even though everybody knows that they're going to write code with bugs in it, but I'm more careful than the other guy. Um, having the automation has really changed the culture to one that when well implemented is much more generous and constructive and forgiving where people are relying on each other and the automation to help correct the inevitable failures. In bio, I see we're still very much in the, uh, you know, 
uh, you know, my experiments are golden. My hands are magic. I would never make a mistake in this protocol. It's those other people who would make a mistake in the protocol. Um, there's sort of this myth that, and, and biology is great for encouraging that myth too, because there's so much complexity in biology. When an experiment goes wrong, the first thing that happens in many rooms that I've been in is that people start hypothesizing about interesting biology that could have caused the effect. When a lot of the time, it's not the biology, it's you know something was wrong with the instrument or there was a mistake or somebody changed something that they didn't think was changed. Uh, you know, I remember one of the very first things that I was involved in in a wet dry collaboration, uh, we were puzzled for months about why uh, you know, something had changed in our results. After about two to three months, the uh, postdoc who was involved finally said, oh yeah, well, I ran out of that plasmid. So I changed to this other one that should be giving the same results because it's, you know, basically the same. It's only got this extra, uh, you know, resistance marker on it. Well, of course, the resistance marker was the problem. It was having a significant quantitative impact, but until we gotten in at a more detailed quantitative level, he was used to working at the qualitative level, where a lot of bio still is. Every time we start working with a new lab or a new group, um, we discover some skeleton in the closet of the laboratory that nobody had ever noticed before. There was some in systemic problem that trying to bring things to the quality standards that machines need exposed and allowed to be corrected and then things work much better but when the integration point is the human head and when there's still a lot of i would call it arrogance uh and defensiveness which our scientific culture inculcates in people you don't want to tell the reviewer i might have screwed it up when they come up with a objection to you it's it's very hard to get people beyond that but once we do we find that the collaborations go much more smoothly and you get much deeper, much quicker into the biological question you're trying to, um, to investigate because you can take away those three to six month dead end detours into something that turns out to have been um, an unnoticed laboratory problem. <laughs>